this is bullshit. <laughs> to quote, as Jay did, our friend Dan Gilmore, you know more than I do. Will Richardson should be up here instead of me. Well, the conversation should be happening there. To quote Jay Rosen, you are the people formerly known as the audience. Yet today, you're an audience, I'm at the lectern, and that is bullshit. <laughs> what does this remind us of? Well, of course, the classroom. The lecture in the classroom, right? where it is really a system built for an industrial age where we stamp out students all the same with only one right answer each, right? Say right. right. <laughs> and, and so that assumes that all the knowledge flows from the lectern. And if you don't feed it back, you're wrong, you fail. What else does this remind us of? Well, from something from Jay and I know well, the newspaper, right? One size fits all, one way. It's the person at the newspaper who decides what questions to ask, what to answer, how to answer, in what form. You're welcome. <laughs> the journalist, like the professor, becomes the speaker, the decider, to use someone else's phrase. <laughs> so I say we should question the form, or more important, we should enable and encourage our students to question this form. Now, I say this all with respect to Ted. I watch many Ted's too, I like him very much. But now having given that caveat, let me tell you about what happened during the last Mothership Ted. Uh, I was tweeting that I, the question, have I ever, has anyone ever seen, honest question, has anyone ever seen a negative tweet about something going on from a Tedster? I never had. Um, I, I wondered whether they hand out the Soma in the swag bags. So ironically, God bless irony, Chris Anderson, the curator, dean, professor, teacher, boss of TED, in fact, had just issued a negative tweet about what Sarah Silverman had done. He apologized for Sarah Silverman's talk at TED, and then he apologized for the apology. So flummoxed was he about the idea that someone was going to come in and challenge with words. As I was asking, what the hell did she do? which took a long time to find out. By the way, she was making fun of Sarah Palin on the use of the word retarded. Um, so as I asked this question over and over again, someone came in, a, a, a Ted acolyte, and scolded me for my tone and, and, and said, you know, you're wrong. Ted gives us so much, so what does it give you? And she said, validation. God, that's the last thing we need is more <laughs> validation, right? Especially in this context. So we need challenges and questions and discussions and, and collaboration and all kinds of other things. But what do schools and journalism do? They validate. Something else they do is repeat a lot. Now in news, I've argued that we can no longer afford commodified news that's already been reported, that everybody already knows, the AP story that's rewritten under my byline because my mother will be proud. Right, ego. Um, we in journalism have to add unique value, I argue. The same can be said, I think, of the academe. Why in the world do we need thousands upon thousands, perhaps millions of instructors over time rewriting the exact same lecture on, say, capillary action? Why do we need that in the age of MIT OpenCourseWare and in the age of YouTube? We don't. It's wasteful, in fact. Um, so I think that educators, like journalists, as I advise journalists, need to become more curators than creators. The good stuff, in great part, is already out there. Why remake it except for ego? Years ago, I had this conversation with Bob Carey, who I think is still at the New School. Um, and he said, you know, what do I do, Jeff, in an age when MIT has these brilliant lectures online? How do I deal with that? And my suggestion was that he not co compete, but that he become uh, if not collaborative, at least complementary. And I envisioned a digital Oxford University where the best lectures are already there and are already made and that he becomes the, the, the font of tutors who can challenge people and who can help them and explain things and take you through individually. 
Um, so that the best lecture on capillary action may come from MIT or Stanford, but in the days of YouTube U, you, it could just be anybody out there who explains it really well and makes a video. Indeed, one of my students is here today from my entrepreneurial journalism class, Joe Filippazzo, who is starting a business called Notebooks to do just that, to pull together the best of the education that's out there and enable ranking and grading, and I hope I got it right, Joe. Notebooks.com. Notebooks.com. <laughs> You notice I taught entrepreneurial journalism, which means selling. <laughs> now, the lecture does have its place to impart knowledge. It does create a, standing, a shared starting point, but it's not the be-all and end-all of, of teaching. It still has its place. But the shared lecture enables an efficiency to be found so that you don't all have to rewrite the same thing. And we need that efficiency in education today. It makes better use of precious te teaching resource. It highlights and supports the best, which is important in a link economy. You link to the best. Um, in fact, I argue in news, I'll argue the same in the academe. There now becomes an ethic that says, do what you do best and link to the rest. Yeah, it's great when it rhymes, isn't it? <laughs> You'd be so proud if it were in PowerPoint now, but aren't you glad you don't have one? I don't have one. Now, I still haven't moved behind this idea of both the lecture and the instructor being the starting point. My real message today, I think, is that the students must be the starting point. <laughs> Amen, brother. There was a, a Carnegie event at the Paley Center a few weeks ago, and I, and I moderated a panel on um, entrepreneurial journalism. And it was only at the end of the session, as I usually like to play Oprah and get down in the, in the pit, in the mosh pit, <laughs> and that I realized what I should do. And I turned to the students and I said, well, what do you think we should teach you? And the list of things that popped out like crazy was wonderful. It was both practical and visionary. So I tell media people that they must become collaborative because the public knows a great deal. The public can do a great deal, as Jay Rosen says. The public want to create. They want to collaborate. And in that, in collaboration is a way to expand news. And a collaboration is a way to become more efficient about news. In fact, the tools that exist today enable a community to share what it knows, and so thus, the cost of news and information has a marginal cost of zero. We in journalism then must ask, how do we add value to that? What's missing to that? How can we improve upon that? Not recreate it, not control it anymore. Isn't the same true of education? Similarly, I tell companies these days that they have to move customers up the design chain. The customer is known as a consumer who only consumes what we give them. True in lectures, true in news, true in most any product there is. I sat next to a guy on the way to a Vegas speech to truck stop owners, I have a fun life, <laughs> last week, and uh, I said that he makes, he makes, among other things, laptop bags. And I said, well, if an organization like, I don't know, TechCrunch came along and used their community to invent just a killer ideal, we know best because we use them, laptop bag, I said to this guy, would you make it? And he said, sure. So we have to move the reader, formerly known as the audience, up the journalism chain. We have to move the customer up the design chain. We have to move the student up the education chain. So to start with the student. Now, students don't always know what they need to know. Granted, stipulated, Your Honor. But we can't know that until we listen to them first. Instead of giving tests all the time to find out what we taught them and did they get it right, Tests should be used to find out what they don't know and need to know. Wrong answers in that case are opportunities and needs. The problem is that we start at the end. We proscribe and preordain the outcome. We have the list of right answers. I have it here. You don't. We tell them our answers before they ask the question. How useless can we be? We then drill them and test them, and if they don't regurgitate back what we told them, we say, you have failed. The system is built, again, for an industrial age, for the assembly line, for stamping out everyone the same, students as widgets. But we're not in the industrial age anymore, are we? We are in the Google age. I like how I did that in a kind of a messianic way. <laughs> Here, Jonathan Rosenberg, who is Google's head of product management, who advised students in a blog post, that he said Google is looking for, quote, non-routine problem-solving skills. The routine way to solve a problem like misspelled search queries is what? 
routine way, it's obvious, come on, anybody? Dictionary, right, 10 points, you got the right answer, okay, fine, you're fine. But that's not the Google answer. The Google answer was to watch and listen to our mistakes and our corrections and where we ended up and to feed that back to us under that magical phrase, did you mean? <laughs> In the real world, Rosenberg said, the tests are all open book and your success is inexorably determined by the lessons you glean from the free market. One more from him. It's easy to educate for the routine, hard to educate for the novel. Google sprung from seeing the novel, clearly. Right? And I have to ask, are we preparing our students? I'm speaking to the choir, I know, but as a system, are we preparing our students to create the next Google or even work for it? Google did not spring from the lectern. It sprung from imagination. It sprung from solving problems. So if not the lecture hall, what is the model for this future world? Well, I mentioned one, which is the distributed Oxford. Lecturers and tutors here and there. Now, once you become distributed, you have to ask the question, do you really need a university? Do you need a school? Do you need a newspaper? Why do you need that institution and that place? Perhaps also, like any news organization, the tasks in this future world shift from creating and controlling content and managing scarcity to curating people and content and creating an abundance of students and teachers. This is a world where anyone can teach and everyone can learn, right? Isn't that what we really should be going for here? without the limits that we now have. But instead, what do we do in education the same as we do in media, the same as we do in industry? We sell scarcity. Only so many seats, take them right now while they're hot, while they're, right? My own poor kid is going to try to get into college right now. He just got into the University of Rochester. We like him very much, they're great, thank you very much. <laughs> but he's a wonderful, brilliant kid who's, of course, everyone's kid is, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, you know, who's written Facebook apps and sold them for enough to, to pay for a year of college and he's an entrepreneur, and I feel guilty to this day throwing him through the mill, grind him out, turn him into an extruded burst. <laughs> uh, but I'm doing it. <laughs> His mother wouldn't let me do anything else, I think. <laughs> so we have to stop this culture of standardized testing and standardized teaching. <laughs> I'll say it another way. Fuck the SATs. <laughs> That was not in the script. <laughs> a simpler question. In the Google age, what the hell is the point of teaching memorization as a skill? I want you to think about that more in a minute. So we have, stop, have to stop looking at education as a product, but rather as a process. Same thing we tell people in the news business, absolutely true in education. There isn't an end day when it comes. In a world of like that, mistakes are the gold. Mistakes are the lesson. Mistakes mean you tried something. Life is a beta. So why shouldn't every university, for that matter, every school, copy Google's 20% rule? It makes perfect sense. You are required to make something, a novel, an opera, an algorithm, a company, something. Then, Rather than the end product to you being a diploma, it should be your own portfolio, which is a far better way to show your ability and your thoughts and your desires. And in that case, by the way, the role of the school shifts from being a factory to being an incubator. And isn't that sound much better? That Schools become the means to try to help students create what they want to create. Google is a platform that enables people to do what they want to do. Mark Zuckerberg said at Davos three years ago that what Facebook tries to give communities is quote unquote, elegant organization. Schools should be that which help organize not only information but students' desires and put them together. So there's one more model for the post-lecture world, I think, which is Dave Weiner's uh, view of the unconference. Uh, at the first BloggerCon at Harvard some years ago, uh, I was running a panel for Dave on politics. 
And I don't know if any of you know Dave Weiner. Anybody here know Dave Weiner? Okay, over here by the, well, everybody who knows Dave Weiner is, is hogging the electricity. <laughs> Dave is a brilliant, visionary, and irascible blog, blogging pioneer, among many other things. He helped, you know, how many of you like podcasts? He helped invent them. RSS, he was there in the early days. All right, so, so I say to Dave something about my panel, and Dave, as only Dave can, jumps down my throat. He says, it's not your panel. There is no panel. You know what? The room is the panel. Ding. Right? And, and I learned something very important there about how to try to moderate and enable discussions in events like this, which I'm not doing right now, <laughs> or in my own classroom. That it's the job to pull out and enable the threads of the discussion and the learning. That that's the real job. So you might ask why I didn't do that right now. Well, because I didn't want to mess with the form, right? Because you're not supposed to do that. And there's one other answer, to be all honest. Ego. <laughs> Thank you. 